On June 30th, 2020, China signed into law a controversial national security legislation for Hong Kong. The law gives Beijing unprecedented powers to crack down on a variety of political crimes in the semi-autonomous region. Those found guilty of grave crimes of secession and sedition will face severe penalties, including life imprisonment. The national security of not just Hong Kong, but the nation as a whole, as, as China. But opponents of the law argue that the new security legislation violates the city's autonomy status, promised under the one country, two systems principle. China cannot just walk away from its treaty obligation. Hong Kong political autonomy is dead. Does the new national security law really mark the death of freedom and autonomy in Hong Kong? Will it eventually erode its status as one of the leading financial and trading hubs in the region? And if so, what does the future hold for the city, once seen as the bastion of freedom in the region? July 1st, 2020, a momentous occasion for Hong Kong as it marked the 23rd anniversary of the territory's return to the motherland. July 1st, 2020, also signalled another significant milestone in the city's history. That's when Hong Kongers woke up to a stark new reality following the implementation of a new and far-reaching national security law. The law gives Beijing sweeping powers not seen before since the territory's handover to China in July 1997. It now has the power to override the city's local laws and punish those involved in various crimes, including acts of secession, subversion, terrorism and collusion with foreign forces. We have a national security law, but Hong Kong has been in the past 23 years. Uh 香港剛才說了,20年、23年都沒有立過法,換言之,香港的國家安全相關的法律是處於一個真空的狀態。The government therefore argues that the mainland security law is long overdue. It should have been enforced 23 years ago when Hong Kong sovereignty was transferred back to China from Britain. But it was held back out of respect for the principle of one country, two systems, which guaranteed Hong Kong certain levels of autonomy and freedoms, including an independent judiciary and rule of law. They could have done this themselves, but they decided that because it's you know, one country, two system, they want to make sure that the law itself uh, comply with the local legislation. So they allow Hong Kong to, to do so ourselves. But we have failed in the past 23 years to pass this law locally. We have made one attempt in, uh, back in 2003, but 
It was not successful. In 2003, about half a million people took to the streets of Hong Kong in protest against a similar security bill. The proposed law carried maximum life prison sentences for treason, sedition, theft of state secrets and subversion. The government maintained that the law was necessary to protect the territory's security. Critics, however, warned that the bill could erode fundamental rights and freedoms of residents in the city. The government eventually backed down amid waves of protests from residents of the city. Even until today, the people of Hong Kong continue to guard those rights and freedoms very closely. One of them is an IT practitioner who would like to be only known by his pseudonym, Philip. Philip was born and raised in Hong Kong and is among those who strongly opposed the 2003 security law. He believed that the proposed bill had violated Hong Kong's autonomy and a direct threat to the freedom of its people. There was a major victory of the civil society back in, in Hong Kong where uh, 500,000 people, they took the streets and then the bill was shelved. There was a, a direct uh, correlation between how the people reacted and how the government re responded. However, we didn't um, took a step further to, to, to introduce reformation of the, of the whole system. We basically still believe in Beijing back then that it is going to introduce universal suffrage to the Hong Kong people. But in hindsight, it, is, um, it was a lie. In 2003, we did uh, introduce, uh, without success, a draft law on Article 23. The difference between that one and the current one is that the 2003 law is a law made by the Hong Kong government. Uh, and of course, at that time, we know what the content of the law is. Uh, people do not uh, um, feel comfortable with the content. Eventually, it was withdrawn. But the rhetoric of defiance continued to prevail. Since 2003, the people have continued to take to the streets to voice their dissatisfaction against what they see as Beijing's persistent interference into Hong Kong's affairs. The continuing protests and political unrest have convinced Beijing that the time has come for the new security law to be imposed in the city. Especially after last year's social unrest and all the different terrorism happening everywhere in the world, I think it's only right that we have this piece of legislation in place in Hong Kong. But since we fail to legislate this ourselves, so I can see no other choice for Beijing to step in, to take back that decision to, to do it themselves. The reality is, the passing of the law has accelerated a sense of foreboding among residents in the city. Those who oppose the law earnestly believe that the legislation amounts to an erosion of the special autonomy status granted to Hong Kong 23 years ago. Hong Kong is part of China doesn't mean that the government can do anything. Beijing has only the right to deal with um, diplomacy as well as national defense on behalf of Hong Kong, but not the so-called ambiguous national security concept. But not all the people in Hong Kong are against the new security law. Among them is Jessica. The 29-year-old has chosen to use a pseudonym for fear of retaliation. She sees merits of the law that gives Beijing expanded powers over Hong Kong, owing to the fact that the territory is an integral part of China. The national security law is really important to prevent Hong Kong from breaking away from our country. And I do see, I do find, um, I do think that it is every citizen's duty to kind of safeguard our country's um, interest and protect our national security. And um, that being said, having lived in the U.S. for so many years, I see that I see that they have zero tolerance for terrorism in the states and they also have 19 of their own national security law to protect their own country. So I think it is 
pretty fair to ha to for Hong Kong to enact some sort of national security law for themselves. We see, uh, you know, in last year's social unrest, we do hear people talking about for Hong Kong independence, asking for Hong Kong independence, uh, and and we do have people talking about taking over control of the government. So that's obviously uh, subverting the state power. That's one, and clearly also you see act of terrorism happening. You know with. Uh, explosive being found, you know, in some of the, the uh, some of the protest movement, and again, you know, we do have local politicians um, appearing in foreign countries, um, in fact, asking for uh, overseas politician to matter of Hong Kong uh, politics. It's totally not helpful. So, so all these things certainly are not giving Beijing the assurance that these things won't happen. However, critics have pointed out that a new national security law is not necessary for a simple reason that many of the offences cited in the new security legislation have already been covered by the existing law. Anybody setting fire is guilty of arson. Anybody damages public property is guilty of malicious damage to property. Anybody beating anybody up is guilty of assault or even uh, assault occasioning actual bodily harm. And if you kill somebody, murder. I mean, all these criminal acts are already governed by existing laws. So why would it justify Beijing taking a step which is unconstitutional which is to en enact national security laws for Hong Kong in Beijing. Doesn't make sense. The continuing debate and political unrest in Hong Kong of late is a clear illustration of how deeply polarized the society is. But underlying all that is a deep and growing mistrust between the people and the central government. This happens despite the assurance by Hong Kong Chief Executive Kerry Lam that the new law will not compromise the city's judicial independence, nor will it affect the legitimate rights and freedoms enjoyed by Hong Kong residents. There is no need for us to worry because time and again in the last 23 years, whenever people worried about Hong Kong's freedoms of uh, speech and freedoms of expressions and protests, Time and again, Hong Kong has proven that we uphold and preserve those values. But opponents of the law aren't convinced. They argue that the imposition of the law is nothing more than an effort by Beijing to silence dissent. But just how true is this claim? The jury is still out. As the debate continues, and as China moves in to exert greater control over the region, international reaction has been swift and furious, in particular from its rival superpower, the US. But how much leverage does the US really have in its efforts to try and shape China's response to the affairs in Hong Kong? Will Hong Kong eventually lose its luster as the main financial and trading hub in the region? seriously undermining the high degree of autonomy of Hong Kong. We do strongly oppose such an authoritarian law being opposed by China in breach of international law. On June 30th, 2020, China began enforcing the new security law in Hong Kong. It's a contentious move that could potentially change the unique characteristics of the city. And until today, the implementation of the law continues to draw a torrent of criticism and condemnation from the international community. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson regards the passing of the law as a clear and serious breach of the 1985 Sino-British Joint Declaration. 
Britain has also suspended its extradition treaty with Hong Kong over fears that those extradited to the city could be tried in mainland Chinese courts without legal or judicial safeguards. Canada and Australia have already suspended similar treaties this month. The EU had earlier warned China of very negative consequences if it pressed ahead with the controversial law. Meanwhile, the Trump administration says that Hong Kong is no longer autonomous from China following Beijing's decision to broaden the security law over the city. The president also signed an executive order which ended Hong Kong's special trading status with the US, revoking trade preferences which have generated an estimated $38 billion in trade annually between the two sides. President Trump also signed a law that imposes sanctions on Chinese officials, businesses and banks found to have undermined Hong Kong's autonomous status. The Chinese government's move against Hong Kong is the latest in a series of measures that are diminishing the city's long-standing and very proud status. Disastrous as that may sound to Hong Kong's economy, some observers believe that President Trump's tough talk against China is nothing more than mere rhetoric, one that lacks substance and teeth. I think you're going to see a lot of this rhetoric going back and forth. And because of the coming election in November, so I guess perhaps it's, it's tricky because China bashing perhaps will, perhaps it will win some of the votes for them. But did they really actually want to go against China? I don't think so, because Ch Trump cares about the economy. So without China as a potential uh, 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 source of a buyer to buy you know, the agricultural products and other things, I mean, how would that help the e U.S. economy? I just cannot imagine that U.S. would want to go and actually censure Hong Kong, because not only it will hurt us, but equally, it will hurt them. My hunch is that actually sanctions will be uh, symbolic. I don't think it's in the U.S. interest to destabilize the Hong Kong as a financial hub, to penalize American companies or foreign companies uh, present in Hong Kong. Meanwhile, sporadic protests have erupted again on the streets of Hong Kong over fears that China is tightening its grip over the city but they have so far been met with strong police response. The day after the law came into effect, hundreds of protesters were arrested by Hong Kong police. At least 10 of them were nabbed for breaching the new security law. One of them, 23-year-old Tong Ying Kit, has been charged with inciting secession and terrorism under the new law. On July 1st, Tong drove his motorcycle into a group of police officers while carrying a flag calling for the liberation of the city. Immediately, I think they would probably target at a few people uh, like Dennis Kwok uh, or Joshua Wong. Uh, these, you can't expect that they're going to arrest a large number of people and they can't do it every day. No. But as time passes, uh, the, the law could be expanded, the interpretation of the law could be changed. Joshua Wong is a young pro-democracy activist who gained prominence during the 2014 Occupy Central protests. The demonstrators then called for the implementation of genuine universal suffrage in the selection of the city's chief executive. The outspoken 23-year-old says that he plans to run for a seat in September's Legislative Council elections after he was barred from contesting in the previous polls. It's a move that will set the stage for a new battle between him and the authorities. Joshua is among many vocal critics of the new law, describing it as the latest example of China reneging on its promise to respect the city's one country, two systems principle. National security law imply one country, two system turned into one country, one system. We could summarize and recognize it as kind of speech crime when they could use the anti suffragian regulation to target the protester, journalists, dissidents, or ordinary citizens, which just means that we might be arrested, prosecuted, and locked up in prison, not in Hong Kong, but in mainland China. Especially when the prosecution might take place in China's court instead of Hong Kong courts, the rule of law and judicial independence is strongly being interfered by Beijing. 
Another key point of contention is the impact that the law might have on the city's judicial independence and rule of law. Following the introduction of the new security law, power now lies with the Chinese parliament's top decision-making body, the National People's Congress Standing Committee. This means Beijing will have the final say over how the law should be interpreted. The whole idea of one country, two system is to allow Hong Kong to run its own common law system. And that would include uh, the power of Hong Kong court or the power of Hong Kong SAR to make its own law, uh, to implement the law by its own police force and to enforce the law by its own court. Now, so that's how you protect the integrity of the system. Uh, and now it seems that all these uh, pillars of protection has gone. Uh, the law is now made by the NPC Standing Committee, uh, a body which is not familiar with the uh, Hong Kong common law uh, and likely it will import some of the mainland concepts. But defenders of the law have argued otherwise. They feel that the law is needed, especially now, to help protect Hong Kong against attempts by those who are trying to split the city from the mainland. Obviously, I understand people are worried about the future and uncertainty, but we've gone through those uh, crises before, and each time we overcome. And the key message is that China continues to believe in Hong Kong. They continue to believe in one country, two systems. So I think that's, that's the key, because they will do everything to make sure it works. So I cannot imagine why China wants to uh, hurt Hong Kong, provided that you don't try to hurt them. That sentiment is also shared by Jessica. She feels that the law will help bring stability back to the city, which has been roiled by a series of protests over the past year. It will also help prevent those who are seeking independence for Hong Kong. I also believe that um, it is important for our country to stay united and that um, foreign influence is not, um, is not used to kind of divide our country and create any form of civil unrest. And I think having the National Security Act in place will actually prevent a lot of these protest leaders or politicians to, from flying, in, flying into Washington, meeting with U.S. Senates, and speaking in front of the US, U.S. Senate to enact laws such as the Hong Kong Freedom Act, and which this Hong Kong Freedom Act would allow um, President Trump to recognize Hong Kong as an independent and separate country on its own. And that alone, I think, justifies Hong Kong uh, for having a National Security Act. Hong Kong is my home. I feel really hurt. I'm very sad over how our city has been turned upside down. There's a lot. Of, there's been a lot of damage, and I've seen firsthand um, a lot of business owners have been forced to close because the protest has been going on for over a year. And from last year to this year, there's COVID-19, and then with the beginning of another round of protest. Um, I, I think the city should focus a, lot, a little bit more on long-term stability. With the law becoming part of Hong Kong's judicial system, how will the business community react to this new reality? Will it continue to have faith in Hong Kong's future? And will the threat to the city's autonomous status contribute to the city's demise as one of the region's leading financial and trading centres?
Hong Kong, widely known as one of Asia's most vibrant financial centers. The city is home to more than 70 of the world's 100 largest banks. It also serves as the regional headquarters for over 30 multinational banks. Its major strengths lie in its freewheeling capital flow, an open economy that is backed by a strong and independent judiciary as well as rule of law. Many international companies also use Hong Kong as a gateway into mainland China to reach out to its lucrative consumer market of more than 1.4 billion people. But Hong Kong's position as a leading financial centre is set to be under threat following the introduction of the new national security law. The business community has been rattled by the law which could potentially undermine the city's judicial neutrality and independence. But some observers believe that in spite of concerns over judicial impartiality of its courts, the level of trust among the business community in Hong Kong's future remains high. Still, the implementation of the new security law does have a chilling effect on business. Plenty of international businesses have trust in China and they have major investments and relationships with uh, uh, the government and, and business entities on the mainland, as well as in Hong Kong. So I don't think that trust in Hong Kong will instantly evaporate. Uh, but that said, all international businesses potentially fall under the national security law simply because they're foreign. Um, so the risks of doing business in Hong Kong have definitely increased. Uh, international businesses can no longer rely on Hong Kong's legal system. Um, uh, they can't count on Hong Kong's legal system to be independent of Beijing. So doing business in Hong Kong will be much more similar to doing business in China with higher risks. But again, the, the potential for, for returns are still there. So I don't think Hong Kong is going to become a pariah in that sense. But it's definitely going to uh, give international companies pause. What they do not realize is uh, the economic success on Hong Kong uh, actually depends on a whole range of things and among them no less important is the judicial system, the legal system, which is different from them. So once you destroy the legal system or undermine the legal system, it inevitably will affect the economic system uh, and Hong Kong by then. If, if the legal system is gone or if the legal system is no longer effective, uh, there's very little difference between Hong Kong and Shenzhen or Hong Kong and Shanghai. Conrad Ho, the CEO of Coho Group, which manages a portfolio of finance, tech and retail assets, however, disagrees. He believes that far from creating uncertainties, the new law will help bring about greater stability to the city, which has been rocked by months of street protests. A politically stable Hong Kong, he believes, will be good for business and the economy. I'm a supporter of uh, the new national security law because I believe that this will allow us to more effectively and possibly like more surgically uh, stop these people from inciting hatred across, the diff uh, across Hong Kong's different groups. Um, and I believe that uh, for that, uh, Hong Kong will be a better place and you know even though in the long run and 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 in the short run even though some protesters may not appreciate it uh, in the long run uh, hong kong will become a better place we, we've seen many big banks and many uh, uh big conglomerates in hong kong supporting uh, this new law uh, the reason is that we believe that it will create more stability in hong kong and that is something that hong kong really needs right now Jessica also echoes the same sentiment, believing very strongly that the pro-democracy protesters have taken away rights and livelihoods of the business community through their violent protests on the streets of Hong Kong. And that, she feels, has to stop. What Hong Kong needs now is stability, which is key to its economic future. How can we ship away the rights of business owners that want to still operate their businesses but they are unable to and they're unable to bring home um, like resources to like provide for their family? I think we need to start addressing these people that their rights are being taken away. 
And I feel like China has been so far a very hands-off type of parent country and that they have done a lot to further our development of Hong Kong as a city. And it is a lot, it is um, because of China that we have now um, kind of accelerated to an international financial hub. All these fears were expressed amid escalating tensions between the US and China over Washington's decision to impose sanctions on Chinese officials, businesses and banks which helped China restrict Hong Kong's autonomy. President Trump also signed an executive order which revoked the city of its trading privileges. It's going to potentially affect um, the ability to do financial transactions with named individuals. Um, it's going to certainly affect their ability to travel to the US and obtain visas. To travel um, and it might make them uh, pariahs because when a an individual or an entity or company has been named to the entity list uh, very frequently other other countries banks uh, won't want to do business with that person because of the risk uh, that they potentially face so so these sanctions could have an impact but at this point it's really too soon to tell how aggressively they'll be enforced. Chinese 如果他真的要打這場仗,其實輸家是美國,是美國的商戶,或者因為他會損失了很多生意。Businessmen like Conrad Ho believes that such actions by the US will have grave ramifications on Hong Kong as a leading financial center if it decides to pursue the latest policy more aggressively. Previously, global investors perceived Hong Kong as being independent. Uh, but due to uh, the statements from the US, um, even if nothing comes of it, foreign capital could still become much more wary about investing in Hong Kong. And finally, uh, Hong Kong is also at risk uh, to lose out in, in terms of its competitive edge against other cities in Asia. Uh, just as a, uh, one example, my, uh, one, one financial firm that my, uh, my, my company works with is actually being forced to move to Singapore because their investors find Hong Kong to be too risky and unsafe for their investors to come for investor meetings. But of late, many companies and financial institutions have come out to voice their support for the controversial law. Notably, two of Hong Kong's biggest banks, British banking giants HSBC and Standard Chartered. HSBC only did so after Hong Kong's former leader, Leung Chunying, blasted the lender for not immediately coming out in support of the law when it was revealed in late May. HSBC is based in London, but generates most of its profit in Hong Kong and Asia. Other companies that have come out in support of the law include the Jardine Matheson Group, operator of the Mandarin Oriental Hotel, and Swire Pacific, the parent company of Cathay Pacific Airlines. I believe that most of the businesses in the world are very hard to do business. It will not be related to the four things you said earlier. It is not necessary to be concerned about it. The only thing is that it has some so-called companies or some of the accounts to support the related to the crime. 他提供的資金、提供的資源去給這些本土的一些暴亂移走他的資產以至到去另外一個地方註冊這個是可以理解的但其他的一般的商業行為我覺得不應該受到任何的影響
But what about Hong Kong's residents at large? Will they continue to oppose the law? Or will they decide to pack their bags and seek out a new life elsewhere? What will this new exodus mean for the city of 7 million people? Will Hong Kong lose its glitter and influence as a financial hub and risk becoming just another Chinese city? A mood of defiance descended upon the city as soon as the new security law came into effect on July 1, 2020. Thousands of protesters took to the streets, venting their anger against Beijing amid concerns that the implementation of the security law would bring an end to their cherished freedom and civil liberties. Democracy activist Joshua Wong is among those who resent Beijing's increasing interference into Hong Kong's affairs. He regards the move to re-establish control over the city as a serious breach of the handover agreement. The fundamental problem is how Beijing broke the promise of the Sino-British Joint Declaration that the International Treaty Register in the United Nations and when they do not respect only liberal value, which is really disappointed and just trigger more and more discontent for Hong Kongers. Under the basic law, which is our mini constitution, only our legislative council has the power to enact, amend or repeal laws. But they are going to do this. And once they have started this dangerous precedent, they will continue to pass draconian laws in Beijing without even bothering to go through a legislative council which it controls. It's too much trouble. Armed with the new law, the police responded swiftly to clamp down on dissent. 370 people were arrested, including 10 under the new law. But amidst the mood of defiance, the new law has also cast a pall of anxiety over residents living in the city. In fact, fear, Uncertainty and defiance have now become a new normal in the region. The final power of interpretation of this law does not vest in the Hong Kong court. That is one major uh, uh, difference. And, uh, uh, and at the same time, the recent resolutions of the MPC also authorise uh, the, uh, the, um, um, the central government's uh, or its national security unit to set up a office, uh, an office in Hong Kong, uh, for the implementation or enforcement of the law. Again, it is pretty vague, uh, but we do not know uh, what these national security organs uh, will be doing in Hong Kong, what its power will be, uh, but it is a fairly scary uh, idea uh, to have a national security unit, which is almost a para-police force, uh, enforcing or implementing the national security law in Hong Kong. Fear and uncertainty about the city's future has sparked concerns about a new wave of immigration of residents from the city. And that comes more than 20 years after the first exodus, which took place during the city's handover to Chinese rule from Britain in 1997. So far, the UK has opened its doors to 3 million Hong Kong residents. Australia, Taiwan, Canada and New Zealand have also offered a similar path to permanent residency in the event of an exodus. Some 50,000 people have already emigrated in the last two quarters of 2019 alone. More are now expected to do so in light of this latest development. Many people who can afford to leave are thinking now of leaving, making plans. And some of the people living here already got passports from Canada, Australia, and they could just pull out quickly, easily. And I'm, I'm afraid a lot of tycoons will go. I mean, just recently, Beijing wanted all our tycoons to go back to Beijing to pledge support to their legislation, which is against our own basic law. I appreciate different countries offering passports to Hong Kong people, because at least that would give an escape route to some of our people. 
The local government, however, is not worried. It's of the view that the problem of immigration is not a recent phenomenon affecting Hong Kong. In fact, it has been there long before the city's transfer of sovereignty from Britain to China in 1997. I'm sad that they make that decision. If they, if they do make that decision, you know, I, I feel sorry for them. But then again, this is actually nothing new for Hong Kong. I mean, we've gone through many crises in all that 40, 50 years, I mean, even before my time. So we've gone through a crisis in the 60s, in the 80s, the early 80s, in the later 80s, and even in the 90s. So we have that so-called brain drain many times. So it's, not, it's nothing new to Hong Kong. But interestingly, if you trust the history, if you look back, in, after each crisis, you see a new rise for Hong Kong. So yes, you know, you know, we saw people leaving, but we, we also saw people coming in. Not exactly for people f that left Hong Kong to come back, but they also have new people coming to Hong Kong. So, I, so I'm actually quite confident that you know, Hong Kong will survive. Right? People will f always find opportunities to come back. Philip, for one, has not considered leaving Hong Kong to seek greener pastures overseas, at least not at the moment. For now, he wants to continue fighting for his rights and freedom for as long as he can. Currently, I do not have any uh, planning to move to a foreign country because, after all, no, no place like home. Um, the, 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 a lot of reasons that I will not want to, to relocate because if my government violate my rights in my homeland, and I escape. Similar things can happen to me in a foreign country. Because the difference is, do I have the guts to fight back? And throughout the past year, since um, the, the 9th of June in 2019, it is the first time that Hong Kongers were willing to fight back towards injustice and um, arbitrary power of government. And um, it is very important for the, um, for the people willing and able and capable of doing something. The ability to say no, it's very important. But saying no to Beijing is not a privilege or a choice that the people in Hong Kong have at the moment. The introduction of the security law is a clear indication that Beijing has now run out of patience with the continued violence and political turmoil in Hong Kong, and is now determined to exert greater control over the city to restore order once and for all. Ngao 但在這個問題上,香港的人們的生活也會受到很大的影響 the uniqueness and economic importance of Hong Kong have begun to wane. Following the rise of China's other megacities like Shenzhen, Beijing, Shanghai, Chongqing and Guangzhou, they now boast an economy much bigger than Hong Kong. With China's decision to gradually integrate Hong Kong into the mainland, will the city run the risk of losing its unique identity and economic importance? 
what distinguishes Hong Kong from the rest of China, and in, indeed from the, the, the rest of the, the world in many respects, um, is, is that uh, Hong Kong is governed by the rule of law. Uh, it has free speech. Um, it has an independent judiciary. Um, these are all very unique features uh, that distinguish Hong Kong from the rest of China. When the um, new national security law uh, is enacted, um, because of the uncertainties um, of this, the scope of this law, as well as the, um, the reach of the law, um, it may be said that, uh, in fact, the, the, the common law that is already that is practiced in Hong Kong will, uh, will be dented. And um, there is a, a gradual um, uh, convergence between mainland uh, and Hong Kong. I think as Hong Kong's autonomy erodes, um, so does its uniqueness, uh, as well as its values in the eyes of many people, particularly in international businesses. And, and that autonomy, though, was seen as a threat by Beijing. So, so they had to take steps uh, to, to bring key aspects of Hong Kong's governments uh, into closer alignment with the rest of China. So I don't think that Hong Kong will ever be just another city, but certainly its uniqueness, its vibrancy, and its overall importance vis-a-vis -vis the rest of China has diminished considerably. For many young people in the city, they see democracy and freedom as the birthright of all mankind. But for China, the freedom that the people of Hong Kong now enjoy is never absolute. And it falls within its national interest to put an end to the political turmoil in the city and protect its sovereignty as well as national security from foreign forces. It remains unclear now how the crisis will unfold or how it will end. But what is certain is that it will be a continuous battle that will see very little hope for a compromise. I think perhaps Hong Kong has been too free in the past that people want to say whatever they want to say. And I think basically um, may, perhaps we have gone too far uh, allowing people to talk about it. I, I just cannot imagine anybody would be s foolish and stupid enough to actually think there is, there is a, any future of Hong Kong independence. But given what happened to last year, I'm not, not sure anymore. I mean, we, we do have a young generation. Uh, you, may, you may call them naive or what, but then, you know, some actually think that Hong Kong can survive on its own, which is, I think, is still ridiculous. It is easy to blame uh, the protesters, uh, and it seems that, that it, what some of the people are saying that uh, uh, an infant central government say that we are forced to act because the protesters have engaged in all these violence acts in the last nine months. It is true that we should not condone those violent acts, but you have to ask the question, what forced those young people to resort uh, to what they have done? There are far more serious and deep-rooted causes uh, behind that. And if we do not address those issues, uh, and a high-handed uh, draconian law will never resolve the issues.